I would like to introduce Joe Miller to each of us this morning. I know that uh, Joe has sent out an email uh, a couple weeks ago about this, but I'm just going to go over the introduction here with you to give you a better idea of what Joe was involved with through the years. He's from MCC and sharing with us here this morning. He served with Mennonite Central Committee on three different occasions. First in alternative service as a hospital orderly, later behind the Iron Curtain in Budapest, Hungary, during the last four years of communist rule. And currently he works at MCC's partnerships with Amish, Old Order Mennonite, Hutterites, and other plain groups across the United States. Joe has served as a pastor for 25 years with the last 12 as lead pastor of Mellinger Mennonite Church. Currently he serves as an LMC bishop and as a member of the LMC executive committee. Joe and his wife, Julie, live in Bridgeport. And I might mention that uh, he was not exactly sure uh, who I was, but I introduced him that his wife is my cousin. Uh, so we have a lot of cousins on that side of the family, so it's a lot to keep track of and, and where everyone goes to church. And so he knew immediately who I was after I told him, and so uh, he found that uh, interesting. And so we are happy to have him with us this morning and share uh, with us. And the scripture text that he has chosen is from Acts chapter 3. So I will be reading that uh, at this time. Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 10, talking about the lame beggar being healed. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate, to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Blessings on the scripture and so we invite you to come and share with us at this time. Thank you. Well, it really is a, a delight to be here this morning, and uh, thank you for your invitation. Uh, if my wife had known she could uh, meet her cousin, she would have come along. She, we didn't realize uh, that wonderful connection. Well, uh, thank you also for the songs this morning, uh, just led in a beautiful way uh, to some of what I want to be talking about and what a, what a testimony those songs are. Uh, so I'm going to have to, if you can go to the first slide and then I think we can move on to the next one as well. Um, so first though, I want to just talk a, a little bit um, about, uh, I've been intrigued. There is in Japanese culture uh, a, a, a tradition, I guess, that goes really far back. And the idea is that if a piece of pottery is broken, uh, they, they put it back together with a kind of a, a compound of gold and some lacquer and some other stuff. And you can see a pic, an imi the image of one of the pieces of pottery that is put back together. And it's called, uh, it's called in English, uh, joinery. And what they say is that they talk about this as a, 
as something that actually, once it's repaired, it's actually more valuable uh, than before. And I, I, I think of that uh, em embracing, uh, embracing of the flawed and, in, and the imperfect. And I, I think that's what God does for us. Uh, we are people who have been caught in sin. Uh, we, are, we are people who live in a broken world. Uh, and we recognize that. But the thing is that the scriptures just talk all the time about how God has not led us in that brokenness, right? But God finds this beautiful way through the work, the life and the death and the resurrection uh, and the coming of the Spirit as a way to put us back together. And in many ways, God sees our brokenness and has healed us. And in some ways, I think God even, even loves us and values us even more because he has poured himself into our, into our lives. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, so uh, just a couple of, uh, a couple of scripture texts that, I, that came to my mind as I was thinking about this brokenness, our brokenness and then being healed by God in a beautiful way through Jesus. Uh, Psalm uh, 147, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds from the, from the Old Testament. And then, and then Jesus uh, is, is this testimony, the crowd was amazed when they saw, and then I, I just broke it apart so we could see the kind of healing that Jesus brings uh, to people as a symbol, as a sim it, it, it impacts that person's life, but it's also a symbol. It's, a, it's, an, it's an image of what God does for the world. Uh, the mute are speaking, the maimed are whole, the lame are walking, and the blind are seeing, and they praise, and, and they praise God of Israel. So that's, that, that's what Jesus is doing uh, in his ministry among us. Okay, can we go to the next one? Well, I wanted to, uh, if, so if you have your Bibles or a device that you can read, uh, I just wanted to take a little, a quick look at, uh, uh, we, to lead into uh, chapter three, the part that, uh, that uh, Elmer read for us. And uh, if, you, if you sort of look at chapters one and two of Acts, you see that is it, in some ways it is a bridge from Jesus' ministry and his life and his resurrection. And then, of course, he, he ascends to heaven. And then the, and then the disciples uh, are gathered together. Uh, they, they, they bring in another uh, apostle. And then in chapter 2, the, there's sort of the, still this internal work of the, of, the, of the church. And just to remember, the church is brand new. This is the beginning of what we call the church. As Jesus ascends and then, and then the Holy Spirit comes and, and, the, and, the, and the followers of, of Jesus are kind of organizing themselves. There's that text in here uh, in chapter two where it talks about that all of those gathered together uh, put all of their possessions, uh, to, they shared them together so no one would be uh, without uh, my Hutterite and Bruderhof friends, they, they love to keep pointing this to a Mennonite and saying, oh, why aren't you following that? But uh, we have good discussions about that. That's, this is the text that causes them to share everything in common. And then the coming of the Holy Spirit, just so critical. And it shapes, the Holy Spirit shapes this, this group into the church. And Peter, Peter explains what's going on. But what happens in chapter three, if you have your, have your Bible in front of you, there is a transition. I see a transition there because now the church starts to reach out. Up in chapters one and two, the church is, is, is still being formed. Jesus ascends, the spirit comes, they organize themselves. And then in chapter three, the church and the followers of Jesus start to bless others outside of the church. I think it's kind of, kind of a critical and important moment there. I don't know what my 
text has here. We'll see what I say. Yeah, so salvation through Christ, healing, restoration, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And then the church starts to work in the name of Jesus Christ. And if you see, I have in my Bible, I mark my Bible up a little bit. And I have in verse 6 and in verse 16 and, um, and yeah, verse 6 and 16 of chapter 3, three times the Christians are saying, we are working, we are ministering in the name of Jesus Christ. And I think that's very important. And incidentally, that is the logo of Mennonite Central Committee, uh, working for relief, development, and peace in the name of Christ. And what is interesting is at different times, some people have suggested, they said, well, we send this material aid around the world and into some other kind of countries, and maybe we're offending somebody with that name, because all, I don't know if any of you do meat canning or not, on every can in the name of Christ in the name of Christ. And some have said, well, maybe you should take that off because you don't want to offend anybody. MCC has said, we're not taking that off because that's what we're doing and that's why we're doing it. Even, even when meat, canned meat is sent into North Korea. MCC is unique in having that opportunity to send canned meat into North Korea, into orphanages, and uh, a TB centers are, are, are using this. And uh, there was a lot of negotiation and MCC said, we're not sending me without that. That is our label in the name of Christ. So the, the church is working in the name of Christ. And so right away, uh, so I think about chapters one and two is some of what we might do on a Sunday morning. It's it's internal work, right? That's what we're doing now. But it's important to realize, I think the text shows us so clearly that the church does not keep just doing internal work. It could have done that kind of stuff, worshiping and all of that by themselves. But right away, chapter three begins to say, now this is the public ministry. So what we're doing this morning, you, I might, you might think of as chapters one and two, and then it goes, you go out. And so you see there that Peter and John are going up into the temple. The early church, for, for they, they were all Jewish at this point yet. Uh, mo well, mostly Jewish. And, uh, but they're, so they're still worshiping up at the temple, but as Christians. They're going, so Peter and John are going up into the temple, and there's that lame man who's been begging. How long has that person been begging? For years and years and years, maybe a lifetime. How many times have the, has Jesus and the others gone past this person? I, we don't know. If any of you go down through Lancaster City, uh, I now know, I know those, I mean, I don't know them, but I know those, this is where that guy stands on that corner of the city. I just know that. He's always there, right? I suspect that's what's happening here. This time, this time they go by, and I can imagine the man, I don't know if he had a cup or not, but you know, just rattling it or whatever like that, and just saying, you know, what's he want? He doesn't even know what he wants exactly, right? He, he you know, remember that text where it says, uh, God can do more than you, than you ask for, or Imagine, yeah, yeah. I think that's what was happening with that guy. He, all he wanted was some money for that day's bread. And they give him, they say, we don't have what, gold or silver, but what we have for you in the name of Jesus Christ be healed. So it's a beautiful, beautiful text. So that, that movement, internal work, that's what we're doing right here, chapters one and two but the church is so quick to go out and start blessing and healing and, 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 and being in the name of Jesus, a blessing. Okay, let's go on to uh, my next slide. Oh, so um, back to that idea, that image of all of us have, are broken, broken pots, broken, broken, broken pottery. We're all, we're all broken. 
And uh, I find it interesting, and, and this is something, I'll let you guys ponder this too. Why is it, why is it that after Jesus, he, he's on the cross and he's wounded, he's broken, his body is broken. He's in the grave and he's resurrected. And what, uh, this is a very famous old painting by an Italian guy, but look, can you see that? I don't know if you can see, uh, Thomas is, is reaching in. Now that's actually not literal, right? Because if you look at the text, we don't know that Tommy, Jesus advice he's touch my wounds. I, the text doesn't actually say he touched, but anyway, this is helps the, this is more dramatic. But what is interesting to me is why wasn't Jesus, the, 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 the marks of his brokenness are not, are there yet. I find that interesting. In Revelation, it talks about up in heaven and in, in the glorified, uh, the lamb is wounded. So I think there's something to be, I think there's something that, that is going on there and I'm not smart enough to figure it out. So, uh, but I think there's something significant that the, the wound, the, the sign of the wound is still there, but he is healed. And I, I think that's for us too, we're healed. Now, here's the thing. Now, go on. Let's go to the next slide. So I wanted to invite you this morning. <clears throat> I think all of us can have the testimony that we have all in one way or another or in multiple ways been broken. So all of us have some kind of a wounding that, that has occurred. But we also believe that in the name of Jesus Christ and in the power of that, that we can be healed. Now, for some of us, the wound, the, the mark, the scars are still there, right? But here's what I want to suggest to you this morning would be, uh, I'm asking you, where have you been wounded? And uh, that's, a, that's not a question that you should particularly answer now out loud. But I do invite each of you to ask that question, where have been, where are those marks? Where have I been wounded? And for some of us, maybe we're still trying, we're in a healing process. We're in a healing process. And, and for some of us, that wound is going to take a lifetime of healing. But, it, but, but by the grace of God and the power of the name and the action and the work of Jesus Christ, we can, we can be healed or we, and we can be in the process of being healed. What is your testimony of God's restoring you? What is your testimony of God restoring you? And I have that in the, what is that? That continuing, right? Not restored, but restoring. What is your testimony? That's so powerful. And we all have that testimony and we all have our own way of saying it. And, and, and however we say it is authentic and it's ours, right? Now, here's the third point. The place of your brokenness is often the place to be a healer of others. I, I just, there's something deep and mysterious about that. So, so I think that all of us, as we go out uh, into this week, we're going to meet people, we're going to all kinds of connectedness on the phone, whatever it is, just to be thinking about, might I be looking for a person that I might share and you don't even necessarily need to go into all the details, right? But even just to say, you know, I have a testimony could be, I, I recognize a place where I've been broken and broken badly, but I'm like that piece of pottery. I've been, I've been healed. I've been wounded. And in God's eyes and, uh, and, 
and maybe, you know, in, in, in my own, without being arrogant about it, but it's all about God to say, I am, I've been healed, I'm being, he, I'm being healed. And th that can be a testimony into somebody else's life. That's the good news. That's what the good news is. So I just invite you to carry this image of this, and you can, you can Google that if you want to know more about it, but it's just an interesting, interesting thing, and, and I just think it's so powerful. So well, let's go to the next one here then. I don't have the pictures in front of me, so I have to sort of look at it too. We get frozen up. I get, well, yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Okay, so yeah. I kind of, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around. Uh, so I've talked about this already, but just anyway, the, uh, this, this text is the part about the uh, Peter coming and saying this and, in the name of Jesus, and, the, and, the, and that man jumps up. He's healed. What a testimony he would have. He is a broken vessel. He was a broken vessel, and, uh, and he is brought back together in a way that is even more beautiful, uh, perhaps, than before. Remember, uh, you remember Jacob back in the Old Testament? And he has, remember that night that he's before he crosses the Jabbok River, what does he do? You remember that? He wrestles with this angel. It wrestles with an angel. It might look like God. We're not quite sure who he's wrestling with. But what happens to him as the, as the dawn is coming and they're still fighting and, the, and this angel, this spirit does what? He touches him, right? Remember that? Touches him in the hip. And the text says for the rest of his life, he walked with a limp. Now that's a testimony. He doesn't even have to say anything. Here goes old Jacob limping along. Every step he takes is a testimony to his wounding and his healing. Powerful. Okay, let's jump on. Okay, so yeah, just, to, just to some of the key things here I wanted to highlight. In the name of Jesus Christ. I think that's just so central. Every time you have a testimony, every time you recognize your own brokenness, or every time you are working to help somebody else to be healed uh, or put back together, in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, there's a reason why, and I'm sure most of you were raised this way too. Uh, my parents were very, 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 very strict about using the name of Jesus in any other way than a sort of prayerful way. I bet you, you, uh, you were not, Elmer, allowed to be doing, yeah, right? You were gotten a lecture, and rightfully so. Here's the thing. That name in the spirit world is so powerful. And we're, we're folks here in North America, we... We're, we're still trying to figure this spirit thing out because it's, oh, I don't know about it. But the name of Jesus is so powerful because what, um, what when we use the name of Jesus, that is, that, and we're doing it uh, as people of faith, that is shorthand. It is, it is, when we say the name of Jesus, we are claiming for that all that Jesus has done, all that God has done. And we're bringing it down, and we're, that, is a, that is a concentrated... Does it, am I, it's kind of hard to explain. I'm not sure if I'm doing very well at that. But the name of Jesus is like calling spiritual forces to, to, to bear on something. So when, 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 when Peter and John go, in the name of Jesus be healed. All, all of everything that God has ever done to restore and, uh, bring, and put us back together and heal, the, heal us and, and, and what Jesus did. You know, laying aside his robes of glory comes down to earth 
and, and, and then teaches and, and, and ministers and shows us what the kingdom of God looks like and then, and then is on the cross and then is, is resurrected. All of that comes to bear when we of people of faith say in the name of Jesus. Ah, that's incredible. So that's, I, that's why we don't use this name in sort of frivolous ways or in a, in a, in a non-spiritual way. We're playing with fire, frankly. Okay, let's go on. My wife told me, uh, you have too many slides, they're gonna be there forever. So we, we need to keep moving, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so I was interested to see your purpose statement here. Uh, we exist uh, to worship God and, and then go, go one more. And I wanted to just highlight one of part of your purpose statement is to demonstrate God's love by serving others. Uh, and that's that, that's that Acts chapter three part, right? One and two, you're doing this. Three, you're demonstrating God's love by serving others. That's, that's Monday morning. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, this afternoon maybe, right? So I just want to acknowledge that, uh, that, that that's key for you guys. And that's part of, part of who you want to be, who you feel God's called you to. Okay, let's go on. Oh, so Mennonite uh, Central Committee, and I just believe that Mennonite Central Committee uh, is a part of that. Uh, it's one piece. You do, you do many ways of demonstrating God's love by serving others. But just to recognize that MCC is in the business of trying to heal, bring healing uh, to people uh, around the world. Uh, so that's uh, restore, restoration and making whole again. I think that's like central to who, who MCC is. And sometimes those are people who aren't even Christians, right? But we believe that by, by serving others, and I think that would be what you'd say, uh, that you can, in the name of Christ, begin a testimony. I mean, all the time, I think, you know, in the 100 years of MCC, how many times have people go, why are you doing this, right? MD Mennonite Disaster Service, same thing. I mean, it has its origins in MCC. Lots of times people are, you know, these Mennonites and Amish and whoever will show up and start, you know, with their mops and buckets and shovels and front end loaders. And they're like, why are you doing this? Well, because we love Jesus and he has healed us, right? We have experienced healing. Okay, so let's go on. And I want to keep my eye on the time here. When do you guys like leaving? And when do you leave, actually? That's some... Um, uh, yeah, well, give me, give me your time that you would say it's... Okay, okay, so I... Okay, well, we'll keep moving here. So, yeah, it was 100 years ago, and, and Russian Mennonites, uh, you know... I could go on. I got to keep myself. So Russian Mennonites are, were in what's today Ukraine and were literally starving. The Ru Russian Revolution had occurred in 19, just a few years earlier. Terrible famine. And uh, there was a farmer out in Kansas where, where I grew up uh, who had relatives back there. And he said, why don't we send them some tractors? There was a bunch of other stuff that MCC did, but the one thing they sent over was these Fordson tractors. We actually have one at the Material Resource Center, if you've ever seen it. So we can actually, there was an old order Mennonite guy who got it, got it running, and so we can run it. But he says, never pull anything with it, you'll, it'll fly apart. So, but it's doing better than I would at 100. So, okay, so we'll, I'll just keep moving here. Well, you know, uh, uh, civilian public service, um, you know, and now it's, it, it, uh, those guys are now kind of older. Uh, and, uh, but it would have been my, my father, father's generation, a little older. Uh, that was, you know, for, so for, for Mennonite guys and, and others, uh, they, you know, didn't, were, were feeling like believing that uh, because of what Jesus had taught, that uh, we couldn't participate in war, but then did this alternative service. And that was, that was very impactful for uh, the Mennonite community. Um, and uh, it took an awful lot of young guys and some women uh, 
to uh, all kinds of places where they began working uh, in hospitals. Uh, so a lot of orderlies, uh, Mennonite guys in civilian public service, uh, you, you probably know this, who got into mental health hospitals all over the place and, and literally changed mental health in the United States. A lot of guys, Mennonite guys, farm boys, got into the mental health hospitals during the war. And, and there were a couple of, there were testimonies from these guys who said, who were just shocked by what they found. Just shocked. A couple of guys would write in their journals or write home and just said, mom and dad, we treat our farm animals better than what these poor people are experiencing. And so that just, that had a powerful impact on mental health uh, here in the United States. Uh, one of the, I, I don't know if you knew, there were some smoke jumpers. Uh, that was the coolest CPS assignment you could get. A lot of guys wanted to do that because, uh, you know, you, if you're 19 years old, it's like, sure, I'll jump out of a plane into a forest fire. That would be awesome. So uh, very, yeah. Now, as you get to a certain age, you're like, are you crazy? Okay, so... Again, it's that, it's that idea of healing. And then PAC service, after the war, after World War II, an awful lot of young, young Mennonite, um, less Amish, but a lot of young Mennonite brethren guys really, really had a conviction. That, I, I, you know, not serving in the war was hard. And so there was this real desire to say, well, I don't, I, I want to give, I want to give back. And uh, an awful lot of work went into uh, PAX guys going over for their alternative service, worked at rebuilding in, in Germany, uh, in, in, in a couple of communities there. Some wonderful, uh, wonderful stories emerged out of that. So that's a building project. Up here in the right-hand corner is a little later. Uh, that guy is in Egypt uh, serving. And then th I love this picture here. A lot of those PAX guys in Germany uh, bought mopeds. Uh, one guy, the one guy's sort of sad. He has a bicycle, but the other guys have mopeds. And the story is that actually, when they after the sir, after their service, they would sell their mopeds to the next generation of. So some of these mopeds were like for several generations of PAX guys. So uh, anyway, uh, just some pictures there of MCC's work, rebuilding, restoring the the war, World War Two, just created tremendous brokenness all, all across the world. And MCC was a part of restoring broken lives. Well, then another interesting project is uh, Operation Dairy. I, I could tell you so many stories, so I have to isolate them, but this was an interesting one to me. Operation Dairy Project, and this occurred in 1956. Well, Lancaster Mennonite Conference, uh, Mennonite Central Committee, Heifer International, and there was another organization, and they worked together to ship uh, 20 uh, heifers over to Greece. There were some PAX guys working in Greece, trying to rebuild the country uh, uh, of Greece after the war. And they said, you know, uh, what, what we really need here would be some prime heifers, cows, really. They were looking for milk cows. And uh, so Lancaster Conference um, got together and uh, they, it's a wonderful story about how they, they bought 20 uh, heifers from Wisconsin, brought them down here to Lancaster County and kept them over on a Stauffer farm on the, east, on the west side of Lancaster and then took them to New, to New York to the harbor and shipped them. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of the cattle boy, the, uh, the seagoing cowboys or not, cattle boats. Uh, so that was what this was, and they sent these heifers over to, uh, to, uh, to Greece. So this guy here is on a cattle boat, and he's horsing around. Of course, he has a fire hose there. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the cattle boat guys in his diary said, on a ship, everybody's a firefighter. If it, if you start, if it starts on fire, you've got to put it out because, you know, you're on your own. And then this is, uh, this is an Ab Abram... Me uh, Abraham uh, Mellinger, uh, who was a member at Mellinger Mennonite Church, he was really the kind of the engine behind this, and he's loading up the heifers here, and he actually was went on the boat over uh, to. Uh, and I go, let's go to the next slide. 
Oh, so this is, this is some pictures from the, uh, the villagers getting these heifers. It's a fabulous story. Uh, the, the heifers and the cows in Greece at that time were just incredibly scrawny. These Lancaster County farm boys could hardly believe it. Uh, and the, the villagers, when these heifers showed up, uh, the villagers said they're like elephants, they're so huge. Uh, and uh, so the idea was, uh, at first there was the idea with the cattle boats, well, let's just send milking cows over, over around the world. And the one guy said, well, don't send milking cows, you have to milk them on the ship, send heifers that are ready, right? So they sent these heifers over. So these are the villagers who are getting these heifers. And they really worked hard. MCC said, we, we need a lot of training. Because, you, you know, part of reality of, of development is relief and development is that you need to help people understand what they got, right? So you just don't drop heifers off and just say, you know, but these, uh, these, uh, these Mennonite uh, uh, farm boys were there to help, uh, to, to say, here's how you take care of a herd. And, that, and so that they're, they're actually giving these heifers out to the villagers, but, there's, but they also, these, these villagers had, had to make a commitment to, to working together. And then the women are starting, you know, are, they start to milk and then the women of the village would come and start putting out the milk for, for the village. So it was a pretty neat thing. And there's still some guys living um, uh, today uh, who, uh, who were part of this. They have great stories to tell, but very impactful. The other thing that the guys in, uh, the Pax guys did in, in Greece, this is in Greece, is they were, uh, in Greece, it's a Mediterranean country and they have lots of, lots of uh, vegetables and lots of fruit. And, and the, and the uh, MCC guys were teaching the villagers, hey, you can can this fruit so that you can use it all year long. Well, you know, they didn't know. So the MCC guys are, are actually teaching, I, I think it's interesting, uh, guys who pro maybe only watch their mothers do this, but, the, but they were teaching the villagers how to can, can uh, fruits and vegetables, or uh, fruits and vegetables, yeah. And even today, th there's a huge, uh, almost a factory that just, this thing grew, and now it's a, a, a thriving um, uh, industry in, the, in this village. And then here's a PAX guy, uh, they also did uh, chickens. Uh, and uh, I talked to one guy, um, a Stauffer, uh, Lamar Stauffer, I don't know if any of you know him, but he, he was part of the chicken operation. Well, he grew up in a chicken farm, so, you know, so that's, uh, they were doing, and then, of course, you have to teach the villagers, well, how do you, how do you really manage modern uh, agricultural operation? Uh, so there, it's, it's different than they had known. So kind of, kind of really neat uh, ideas of, of, of restoring and, and healing and empowering people in the name of Christ. Okay, so uh, what time? Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I would say that uh, I don't know if, if any of you are involved in, in any MCC stuff or not, but some ways that people are involved uh, and, and I demonstrating God's love by serving others, a part of your purpose statement. And one of uh, several ways. One is meat canning. Uh, probably, I think they do meat canning over here at Whitehorse. That's probably your closest to you. But uh, meat canning, and then some groups, uh, individuals, volunteer at the uh, Material Resource Center over uh, behind Ephrata there. Also, people are involved in thrift stores volunteering. Thrift stores, I did not realize until I actually joined working here with MCC, how important thrift stores are to, to it's like a third of MCC's budget. It's, it's incredible, I, I had no idea. Uh, assembling kits, sometimes churches or families will do school kits, uh, hygiene kits, prisoner kits. I didn't list all the kits, but uh, that's kind of a, a neat thing to, to be involved in. I, I, you know, Whenever we do a shipment, uh, you know, we, we load these big shipping containers at the, at the warehouse there. And every time we have a prayer of dedication as, the, as you go out, you know, just to bless 
where these things will go. And, and the stories we get back are just, just incredible. I mean, we, we are so blessed. I mean, you know, they, for a, a relief kit, you know, a, a five gallon bucket, soap and a comb and, and just the, a towel, towels. And that just, that's just a life. <laughs> it's, it's just life giving to people. And, uh, and you know, now most of us know the value of a five gallon bucket, even a good plastic five gallon bucket around our homes. But uh, do you, can you imagine what a five gallon bucket of that, you know, sturdiness would, how important that is in a, a refugee camp? It's incredible, just incredible. In fact, they, in some places in the world, they even keep the shipping container and turn that into a place to live. It, it's just amazing. <clears throat> Uh, international visitor exchange that is uh, <clears throat> that's Christian young people not not all not necessarily Mennonite or anything but just Christian young people who come to the United States and spend a year and will live with a family and 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 work somewhere as a way to have an a, a, an experience an international experience and then uh, serving and learning together that's Americans U.S. going somewhere going around the world. Uh, so that's that. Sharing with Appalachian people, that is a, that's normally about a week, and that can be different kind of groups. Lots of times youth groups do that. They go down to Appalachia and for a week work at restoring people's homes. And it's a pretty neat, our son was a part of that when he was in high school. And, and it's kind of neat what they do. They teach that you're obviously helping to repair homes and put on a porch or whatever it is. But you also get to learn about Appalachian culture because it's, you know, it's a cross-cultural experience as well. Uh, Anabaptist older, uh, older adult service opportunities, that's at Eastern Mennonite Missions, EMM and MCC uh, uh, joint thing. And that's, I, I, I don't think of myself as old, but I guess I am because I could qualify for that. So that often is a short-term two, three week or whatever. Uh, so that's kind of a neat, neat thing. Uh, you know, if you have grandchildren, you don't want to be gone for three years. So uh, could you do a month? You could do a month. Okay. Uh, church, uh, church family days. A lot of churches will, will do a day at uh, half a day at uh, the uh, material resource center, which is kind of cool. Some families do it. Then on Wednesday, it's just a big grouping of people before COVID hit, there were probably 120 people there on a, on a Wednesday. Kind of a nice core group of people. Uh, and then financially supporting uh, MCC. So thank you for that. Let's go on. I see where, where I'm at here. Oh yeah, just again, recognizing that your, your purpose statement, one of the things that you're committed to here, you feel God's called, you feel God's called to, uh, so we, we as MCC want to partner with you in whatever ways feel appropriate in, in achieving that purpose. Okay, we'll go on. Yeah, so I, in the, I don't know if any of you are, get this quarterly magazine or not, but I have an article in there that will come out here in October on, uh, I, I wrote a rather long article on the impact the, the positive impact that Mennonite Central Committee has had on Mennonites in Lancaster County. And it was a, it was a fun project to work on. So, you know, if you're interested in that, uh, I call it Dear Ones at Home. So anyway, and then one more. Uh, and then I have here, my wife and I served in Budapest, Hungary for four years, uh, as, you, as you pointed out. Okay, so, my wife wrote that for four years, she was writing letters home with the intention that it could sort of be a journal. And so in the last year, she took those letters and turned them into a kind of like a book, but it's really online. So you can just go and it's just stories about our life there for four years. So if you're interested, you can, you can just go to that budapestjournal.wordpress.com. Uh, so, um, yeah, I think I'm done. And uh, so uh, one more slide, and then that's just a thank you to. Uh... So let's, ha let's just join together in prayer. God, we're so grateful that we are able to 
minister in the name of Christ. We love the testimony of uh, Acts chapter 3, where the people who have received salvation, who have received the good news, uh, and receive then the Holy Spirit to live out and act out uh, the, the, the good news. And we're just so grateful for that, God. Let us help us to be people uh, who are chapter three uh, Christians, where we go out and bless and heal and restore. And not us, but that we are the vehicle for people's healing and restoration. Uh, from their own brokenness. And we, did, we do that in the power and the name of Jesus Christ.